You've entered Bookstorm with Kristen Civiletto and me, Chris Storm. This is a podcast devoted to best-selling books that matter, books that make a difference. We're diving down deep with beloved authors about their stories. We're exposing hot-button topics and heartfelt themes, the issues that affect each of us in our own lives as siblings, parents, partners, friends, as human beings. We're braving new ideas, fresh thoughts, hard lessons and important truths. Those kinds of things that stay with us long after we turn the last page and close the book. Well, welcome back listeners and book lovers. Uh, We want you to know we're also listening to you. Many of you have written in telling us about this fabulous novel that you loved. And yes, we took a look at it and we agree. So today we have the brilliant Chris Pavoni with us on Bookstorm. And we're here to talk to him about his latest New York Times bestseller, Two Nights in Lisbon. But before we do, let me give you a little history on Chris and all of his success. So Chris is the author of four international thrillers, The Expats, The Accident, The Travelers, The Paris Diversion, and now Two Nights in Lisbon. His novels have appeared on bestseller lists like The New York Times, USA Today, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Chicago Tribune, and I could go on and on, but we don't have time to talk about all that. Just amazing. He has won both the Edgar and the Anthony Awards. His books are in development for film and television and have been translated into two dozen languages. Very impressive. Chris has appeared on Face the Nation, Good Day New York, All Things Considered, and BBC. He has been profiled on the arts front page of the New York Times. That's just incredible. He is a member of Penn, Authors Guild, International Thriller Writers, and Mystery Writers of America. And just a little about him personally, because I think it's so interesting. Uh, He grew up in Brooklyn, went to the prestigious Cornell University, and he himself worked in the publishing industry for nearly two decades. Dell, Doubleday, Lions Press, Regan Harper Collins, and he had positions ranging from copy editor, managing editor, executive editor to deputy publisher. Wow, that's quite a career. He, uh, his wife then took a job in Luxembourg. That had to be very exciting. Uh, he moved his family and raised his twin boys, and we are not surprised what came next, living as an expat, his first book, The Expats which we loved. They now live in New York City and the North Fork of Long Island, which I think he is located today at this interview, and they have an Australian Labrador named Wally. Thank you, Chris, for joining us. We're thrilled to have you here today. Thanks so much for having me. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor. Um, happy summer. Happy summer. And, and we love the fact that we have another Chris joining us. So make it a little confusing, but that's okay. <laughs> it's a lot. Uh, uh, Chris, we like to give a little bit of a background on the books that we read without giving away any spoilers. So if you'll allow me just very briefly, I'd like to tell our listeners about it. And we'd love if you want to add anything, of course, at the end. Uh, but Two Nights in Lisbon is a thoroughly engaging international thriller about a new marriage, but set against the backdrop of power and politics and narcissism and revenge. That duality is what I absolutely loved about this book. Ariel Price wakes up in Lisbon, Portugal, alone. Uh, Her new husband, relatively new, is gone. There's no warning, no note. He's not answering his phone. Something is wrong. Ariel does what anyone would do. She texts him. She's trying to find him. She asks the hotel staff, and then the police, and then the American embassy. And at each level, she is confronted by questions that she doesn't always have the answers to. For example, what exactly is her husband John doing in Lisbon? Who was he supposed to meet with? Why would he drag her along on this business trip? 
she doesn't always have the answers about her new and much younger husband, and this is causing consternation amongst all of the people who are interviewing her. Ariel is increasingly frustrated. She's desperate. She's running out of time. And the one person in the world who can maybe help is the one person she, she least wants to ask for help. Would you add anything, Chris, to our- That's a very good on? description. Thank you. Okay, good. <laughs> good. Wonderful. Well, if you're ready, Chris, Chris, we will brave the storm. And I know Chris will start us off. We are super excited about this. Uh, I just want to say for our listeners that Chris Pavoni is a masterful storyteller in not only thriller, but suspense and mystery. And I'm not the only one who feels this way. John Grisham and Stephen King both uh, endorsed this book and said they could not put it down. And that is exactly the truth. Now, with a great mystery like this, the tricky part about our interview is we can't tell too much of this plot because we don't want to give any spoilers out. But what I thought was so incredible, and I thank you for this, Chris, you wove a beautiful mystery but you added so many life lessons and truths that as we're looking at your beautiful, rich characters, we're seeing a little of ourself or maybe even learning something about ourself. So at one point, I want to quote your protagonist, Ariel. She says, but you pay a price for everything, don't you? Uh, some prices are hidden, invisible. Sometimes the price doesn't even become apparent for a very long time. Sometimes you never even recognize it. You never understand that you already paid it. Sometimes you yourself is the price. And I just thought, wow. In Ariel's life, we saw this in so many ways, but also in our own lives. And I wanted to ask you, as the writer and creator of this beautiful character, when is the price for what we want too high and what was it inside Ariel that I believe helped her to evolve into realizing this what characteristics that's hard it's um I think we don't spend quite enough time examining what it is that we want and why we might want it and this was really brought home to me a couple of decades ago when I was when I was a book editor, I was for a while specialized in cookbooks. And I was doing this at a moment in time when people on Food Network were first becoming really famous. And I, uh, I had one author who, when I signed up her first book, she, her show had just launched with a few episodes. She didn't know if it was going to get renewed. She was not at all famous. It was not a big book for us. Um, but in the year, year and a half that it took to bring the book to publication, she became famous. And right before publication, she came to New York and we had meetings with all the marketing and salespeople. We went out to Starbucks to get a coffee to catch up on our personal lives. We were the same age and we were friends and we'd worked together closely for a couple of years. And as we're sitting there, person after person kept coming up to her in this coffee shop to say that they were fans, to say that they loved her, to want an autograph. And she was really very generous with these strangers and her time. And I think her genuine generosity is one of the things that helped make her successful. But to me, it looked horrible. And I never before considered what it meant to be a beautiful, famous woman in America. And that all of a sudden I saw that it can be an immense burden. I think it's always an immense burden and that it requires you to interact with the world in a way that you didn't sign up for and requires, allows the world to interact with you in a way that can be very uncomfortable all the time. You're walking down the street or browsing in a bookstore or sitting in a cafe having a professional meeting and you're always about to be ogled or propositioned or interrupted. And that's just, that's not even the worst of it by far. And I think in America now, we increasingly celebrate fame and beauty for their own sake, completely divorced from any skill or talent or contribution to society or anything, just beauty qua beauty is a goal, fame qua fame. Like if you're beautiful and you're famous, that counts as a success. 
without really examining what that means, what are we doing to especially young women by encouraging them to have careers that are entirely premised on being good looking and that the more good looking you can make yourself into, the more successful you will be. And that is sort of taken as a given right now. If you look at social media, if you look at any media, that's what's going on in, in large part. And I think that it's horrible. Um, that said, I didn't want to write a book that's a polemic against shallow beauty. That's, that's not what this is. That's the, one of the foundations of her character, though. As someone who, like my author, has entered into this world with this bargain that she didn't necessarily make, here I am, this person who didn't choose to look this way, and yet I have to interact with the world, and in particular, with men and specifically with sometimes dangerous men who are choosing to look at me only as an object of sexual desire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's incredible. And we've talked about this a couple other times on the podcast, this societal notion of what is beautiful. And, and I love this character, Ariel, because I did love the fact that she was beautiful, but I like the fact that she did not, she wasn't, uh, thrilled about that, that as you just explained, it was kind of a hardship on her. And I also loved, and this is not giving away a spoiler, that she was very affluent, living in Manhattan with all of the things that go along with that lifestyle. And at one point, she wanted out and ended up moving out into the country. I loved that about her too. Um, I think you showed us a lot of growth in her life. And uh, Yes, I, I absolutely see that. We all do this a little. No matter what we try to attain, whether it's fame or fortune or notoriety or power, we, we forfeit our personal lives, our privacy, our time with our family, uh, things that we would rather be wanting to do on a daily basis. Sometimes this is good, but sometimes we lose ourselves in the shuffle of it. And I think that your book wove this in there and kind of reminded us all of this. Thank you for that. Very powerful. Thank you. Yeah, I also think it's interesting that we often evaluate that bargain when we have the least amount of maturity to do it. Yes, yes. absolutely. And I, I think one of the things that's so dangerous right now and will continue to be dangerous for decades, no matter what happens in the next few years, is right now there are generations of teenagers coming of age and about to launch themselves into the world who have grown up entirely with this activity of posting pictures of yourself to everyone you've ever met online and waiting for them to say, OMG, you're so pretty, and heart, heart, heart. And there are millions and millions of people who do this every day. And I can see why. I can definitely see why. If I were 13 years old and really, really insecure about myself as all 13 year old, 13 year olds are, and I could post a picture of myself wearing a bathing suit and hundreds of people will tell me how good looking I am and how much they love me, of course I would do that every day. And of course I would think, all right, how can I make myself better looking? How can I get more of this? This is so satisfying. This is so wonderful. How can I do more and more of this? And then next thing you know, that's what you've been doing for five years. That's who you are. You are a person who goes out into the world asking people to tell you that you're beautiful. Um, and I think that's tough. And these, these people right now, these young people are going out into the world, having grown up doing this. Absolutely. And there's such an epidemic of depression with young people through this, too, because Absolutely. it's not always fulfilling. And I think they've had psych psychological studies where endorphins are actually released with this social media interaction. And you, it's subconsciously, you don't even realize the uh, effects that it's having on your psyche with that. And yeah, I th I, we agree. We've been, we talk about this quite a bit on here, that this is a very bad problem. Yeah, we agree. I'm really happy I want to add this. Instagram just started something new where you can block the number of approvals that you have. So no one sees how many likes you have. And I like that. So as Bookstorm, we have to be on there. We're stuck on there. 
it's our, it's our advertising. This is how we get our name out in a good way. But I like the freedom of that because we really are just wanting to tell people about these great books. We're not looking for a uh, huge response. We just want to spread the word. So that's refreshing, and I hope that that might be a telltale of where the future is, but I don't know. I don't know. I think that's great. It's, I mean, I, I feel like we've all gotten suckered into, even, the, even the, the least of us who are willing to do this, being in a constant popularity contest. Every day is a new popularity contest in which you are forced to measure yourself against the popularity of your friends and your peers and your colleagues. Um, and I, I think it's very pernicious and I think it's damaging, damaging all of us. Um, but in fact, that's not really, social media is not really what this book is about. And social media is something that people, the characters in this book actively um, run away from and ignore, partly because they're mostly my generation um, or older and uh, we're just not as into social media as younger people, but really it is still fundamentally about this issue of how do we see ourselves and what is the bargain we make with the world and what are the sacrifices that those bargains entail. And for some people, not of their own choosing or sometimes of their own choosing, the bargain turns out to be something that, they're, that they regret, that they're not willing to make. And what do you do about that at a certain point in your life or ever when you realize that the bargain you think you've made with the world is not okay with you. And that's a hard position to be in. I think a lot of people find themselves there. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't think it's giving out too much of a spoiler to say that Ariel, the main character, and our readers are gonna love this about her. She, d It's not just an awareness that I've given up everything for something I thought I wanted, but the, it, the, pay, the payoff the, doesn't equal what I've put into this. It's that, um, you have to have the courage to change. So you may be able to say, I need to change, but then you need the courage to do it. And yeah. for some people, it could be monetary reasons, or it could be other reasons that you're forced into this life that you have. But Ariel gave us all a little bit of hope, like a little bit of uh, encouragement, and it just inspiration. She was inspiration. Loved it. Thank you. Good. Uh, Chris, I'd like to delve into another mindset issue that you tackle in this fantastic novel. Um, Ariel's frustrated with the way the system works. And, you know, it, her mindset is it is rigged against her, she believes. And she takes steps to rectify that perceived injustice and engineers a way to, I'm going to put this in quotes, win. And her solution, though, isn't exactly ethical, and again, without giving away anything. I wanted to see if we could talk a little bit about this idea of a justification for wrongdoing, right? Are all reasons for people acting in maybe an unethical or uh, inappropriate way justified? Are there more legitimate reasons than others? I was wondering if you could kind of tackle that a little bit. Definitely. Um, I think the idea of wrongdoing is very, very subjective by its very nature. and. I think particularly at this, this moment right now in America really highlights the subjectivity of wrongdoing. At, at this moment, almost everybody in the United States, almost anybody who's paying attention to anything has thought about the issue of abortion right now. And abortion is one of those issues that I think is the ultimate in subjective moral assessments. Both pe people on both sides honestly and passionately believe that the people on the other side are committing the ultimate wrongdoing. And I think that's true for everybody. And I don't think there's a lot of middle ground there, that if you are fervently anti-abortion and you think that it's murder of children, then that's a pretty strong position. And there's not a lot of room to wiggle out of that. If you, on the other hand, don't believe that and you believe that outlawing abortion is taking away the fundamental rights of not only all women, but everyone. It's telling people that you are not responsible for the most important decisions you make to your own body. Then that too is the ultimate in moral wrongdoing. And I feel like, you know, we just celebrated the so-called birth of America a couple of days ago or yesterday. Where are we? Yesterday. And, you know, one way of looking at the American revolution was that, um, it was 
it was a heroic move by colonists to overthrow a tyranny. Um, another way of looking at it, though, was that it was a move by a bunch of greedy and traitorous landowners who wanted to continue to be able to enrich themselves primarily through owning other human beings. Um, and those are two very different ways of looking at the same event, and both of them might be true. Um, and I, I think I am very much a moral relativist, and I think that almost any situation can be looked at honestly by both sides. The, the people I have no respect for whatsoever are those who pretend to, be, to believe something they don't just in order to get personal gain. And that bothers the hell out of me. But in most situations, I do believe that most people not only justify the wrongdoing as telling themselves that it's not wrong, but in fact, believing that what they did isn't wrong. And, you know, I don't think that drug dealers are walking around the streets thinking, boy, I'm doing something wrong. I think that what they're doing is doing the only thing that they can do to provide for themselves and maybe their families and stay safe. Um, I don't think there are a lot of people walking through the world thinking I'm a bad guy. I don't think we, we believe that. And I, I think there are a lot of things that can be justified or explained away as benign little lies. And I know myself as a parent of little children, I used to tell things to my little kids every day that were not quite completely true, just in order to, you know, keep the peace and have bedtime happen. Um, I never thought of those things as evil. I don't think there's, I don't think it's true that untruths are by necessity wrong. I do think, however, that we've gotten ourselves into a position in America where lying has become so commonplace and so universal on an everyday basis about everything, about what's the best hamburger in town or where the cheapest gas is or who won the election or what democracy is. And we've become so inured to lying by its prevalence and we accept it so much more now because it has happened so much. And I, I honestly think that the death knell to civilization might very well be the phrase alternative facts. And that has to me nothing to do with politics. I, I don't, I, Republican versus democratic politics, big government versus small and high taxes or low, hawks or dove, that has nothing to do with what I consider the very, very dangerous erosion in the past half decade of simply the idea of truth. There's less and less agreement about the fundamental facts of the world. And people are now going around saying, to me, the equivalent of two plus two equals five. And other people are saying, definitely, definitely five. And I feel like I, I don't know where we go from here, where we no longer accept as facts things that five or 10 years ago were obviously facts. So oh boy, that's pretty doomsday, isn't it? I'm sorry. No, not at all. <laughs> true. I love that you brought up this idea of um, whether there's an objective morality or things objectively good or bad. And I spend a lot of time talking, especially with students. I teach law students and we talk about these issues of, you know, if, if something is inherently good or inherently bad, we look at factors like, you know, does it lead to disintegration? Does it lead to harmony? Does it lead to, ho you know, wholeness or something else that is we associate with being bad? But then we've got to weigh that against the viewpoint you were bringing up of this moral relativism. And wow, this is to me the heart of everything that we are debating going on right now, ranging from abortion to leadership to um, the media, right? Doesn't this underlie everything we're talking about in some respects? We Definitely. Could, we could spend like three hours on that topic alone. Of <laughs> oh, we could. Oh, I, I think we had about 10 questions and we had to cut them down. We always <laughs> offer four. But what you were saying about lying goes into the next topic I wanted to bring up because I wrote down this quote from Ariel. He can't possibly know that everything's going to be okay. But that's what we do sometimes. We lie to each other even when everyone knows that lying is what's going on. Sometimes we call this politeness, optimism, politics, public relations. Um, we just talked about it. Why do we, there's different levels of lies. There's the little white lie. Do you remember that uh, movie, um, 
by Jim Carrey, that comedy that was out years ago called Liar, Liar, where all of a sudden he was in incapable of lying. Well, I ju it just struck me so funny because I think every day we tell these little white lies and they're not really, we don't believe they're going to cause any harm. Like, how do I look today? Oh, you look great. Well, maybe we're thinking, you look terrible, but I'm not going to tell you <laughs> these, little, right. these little lies. But then what you had brought up is this has somehow progressed to very big truths that we're unwilling to say our truth anymore. And yes. maybe, maybe it's even within ourselves because we're afraid of the truth or we're afraid of confrontation. So we just say, oh, I'm just going to go along with that. Yeah, that's, that's true. And, and, and so even the character Ariel, um, she wanted to believe some lies for a little while till she pulled her life together and saw it in a different way. And I just thought, uh, here's my question that came with this. So, but are all lies, all lies bad? Maybe some could be okay. Maybe a lie like this, I'm going to do it. I'm going to get that. I'm going to get that job. Mm -hmm. Even if it is the most unlikely thing, mm -hmm. I'm going to, I'm going to get married, even if it's unlikely, whatever your circumstances are, but maybe some lies are okay. I don't know. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts on that? I think there's a big difference between lying about things that are subjective and lying about things that are objective. And I think telling yourself, telling your friend, you look great today telling yourself you're going to get that job. Those are not things that are, that are factual. Those are, you know, that's an assessment. Your friend looks good or she doesn't look good. Everybody's better off in your relationship if you tell her she looks good. There's no good that comes from saying, wow, you look like crap today. <laughs> um, you know, and the same maybe is true about, about lying to ourselves about our possibilities for su success in something, whether that's getting a job or or getting married or winning a tennis match or anything. Like maybe, maybe it helps everybody to simply be positive. And I don't think that that's necessarily that harmful. I think it's harmful if we do it all the time and deliberately and consciously just tell ourselves things that aren't true and then we've lost track of reality. But what I do think is very, very harmful is lying about facts and lying about, I mean, I know I, I said this already, two plus two equals five, but also, you know, there's no harm in COVID. Vaccines don't work. Masks don't work. Uh, the election was stolen. Like these are not actually subjective matters. And these are matters of fact. And lying about matters of fact erodes the very idea of fact and makes people think that these are subjective things that, all right, maybe the election was stolen despite the fact that there are no facts that support that, no facts that support that. And yet every day, more and more Americans somehow believe that it's true simply because that lie has been told to them over and over and over again. And that's a much more dangerous lie than you look good. Um, and I do think that they are very, very different things. And I don't know what the solution to this is. And obviously there's a question of, of free speech that people have always relied on in order to justify saying things that they know are not true. And in business, there's a lot of, I think, discourse that is less than completely forthright about things like your, you know, your prospects for the future. But when people start saying that our profit last year was a hundred million dollars when it was really a loss of $10 million, that is much more dangerous. And that's the type of fact that I'm talking about. We can't, we should not allow ourselves to get away with, with the excuse that it's just business or it's just marketing or it's just politics. I mean, it's not just politics to, to say that that an election was was stolen. I mean, that's, that's eroding the very idea of what democracy is or what facts are. And I don't know how we fix that situation. And it's gotten so bad in the past very, very short amount of time, I think. I mean, I, I've always sort of lamented our willingness to tell each other untruths in this country, especially in the pol political arena. But to me, it has really accelerated so much recently and it, it looks like uh, an unsolvable problem all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And these lies go back, I can't tell, to your story somewhat because lies were being told Okay, I gotta be careful what I say, but 
the reason that these lies are being told is that someone wants power or success or uh, ach an achievement, and in order to tell these lies, they get what they want. So yes. I, and I think social media is a huge culprit because there's a lot of people spreading false things, putting out little news stories that have no basis whatsoever. So what I always tell people is, where did, where'd you hear this? Where'd you get that from? Oh, oh, you got that from Facebook? I don't think that may not be the best place to get your news. Go yeah. to a legitimate source. Go to the NIH or the CDC or go to a good news source. And maybe just what you said right there, Chris, that we need to fact check. You know, we need to not just blatantly, easily accept everything coming our way and really have uh, the responsibility to look into it before we, we ourselves spread fake news. That's a very yeah. hot topic. Very. It is. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a final question, and again, we could go into so many different themes and emerge from your novel. It was so good. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about this dual theme of narcissism that runs through your novel. Because first of all, from a big picture standpoint, there's the idea that we tend to believe we're living at the climax of the story. And I love this quote. We're uniquely important. We're living at the end of history. It's the worst it's ever been. Many, many times people have that mindset. I've heard it at least three times this week from different people. But then on an individual level, you highlight characters that display characteristics of a classic narcissist. And I was wondering if you could kind of comment on this, because this is clearly prevalent in the book. Do we all have a tendency towards these characteristics of narcissism? And many people believe that powerful people display these characteristics disproportionately. Do you think that's true? Um, well, I think I have no doubt that uh, narcissists are drawn to seek power. I mean, that's part of the definition of being a narcissist. I don't know if that makes them more successful at it or not, but I mean, can you imagine thinking that you should be president of the United States? I can't, I can't imagine growing up, being a person who has lived in the world for 50 or 60 or 70 years and thought I should be the most powerful person in the world. I can't imagine that. You have to have a pretty high opinion of yourself in order to do that, and a high opinion of yourself that sort of defies everything else. And again, this has nothing to do with, with right or left-leaning politics, but it's just the very idea that there are these people running the world who are people who think they should be running the world is sort of strange, because to me, that, that means that by definition, they're narcissists. Um, I think to some extent, no, not to some extent, we all see ourselves as the heroes of our own stories. It, it's, we're certainly the protagonists, even if our stories aren't especially interesting or important to anyone else. And that's that's what real life is, but that that's not what fiction is. And the reason I wanted to write this book, the whole point of Two Nights in Lisbon, is that sometimes one person's little story might in fact be important to everyone. And that one person seeking justice might be saving the entire country or even the whole world. And I think we all come to fiction to look at parts of the world that we recognize, but also bigger and amplified and with higher stakes, with, with more serious conflicts and more grave outcomes. And I think there are aspects of this of two nights in Lisbon that I hope will be recognizable to lots of readers is real parts of real life. But also I wanted to construct a story in which much more is at stake than the normal things that are at stake in my life or your lives or the lives of most teenagers who have unfortunate Instagram feeds that that's all real life. And we don't necessarily need to read about all that in novel form. The beauty I think of fiction is to be able to take things that we all recognize and turn them into something more universal and more important than just one little life. Absolutely, very well said. Thank and you. That's what we love so much about fiction. And we have people that say to us, you're gonna bring some nonfiction books in. And I said, we, we've got our hands full with fiction, but that's what we love about fiction. Yes, fiction is fantasy and it's pretend, but is there any such thing as true fiction? Because we draw from real life experiences and things that we see in the world and real emotions and feelings. And that's why when we opened this book, Kristen and I, Two Nights in Lisbon, we loved it so much because we saw little bits of ourselves in there. In not just Ariel, 
but other characters as well. Maybe some good things, maybe not some good things, but it makes you take a little introspective look and just makes you more aware of everything. So we highly recommend this book for our readers. You I, are just going to love it. The whole time I read it, I thought this would make an excellent film, which I hope is going to be on the way. And can you tell us, uh, what are you working on next? What's on your radar? Give us a little, can you give us any clues? No, I can't. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I can tell you this. I, as I've done a few times before, I'm working on two novels at the same time, sort of like throwing them both into a boxing ring to see which one is going to knock out the other as the clear victor. And uh, that hasn't happened yet. It's not going to be an early round decision. And partly I've wanted to wait out. This Two Nights in Lisbon was just published five weeks ago. And uh, I've spent a lot of time promoting it. And I took a pretty big pause on writing those manuscripts in order to write a lot of the stuff that needs to be written to promote a new book. And part of my pause, which still is sort of continuing, is I think it's very hard to figure out what the right next book is for an author to write. And that doesn't necessarily mean the best idea for the clearest story, but at this moment in my career and at this moment in the history of the world and American culture, what what's the right thing for me to be writing about? And that's a hard choice to make. And I, I feel like Two Nights in Lisbon was for me the book of mine that was drawn most from an impetus to do something in the world that's a little less irrelevant than I think a lot of crime fiction can be. And I, I love crime fiction. I like mysteries. I like thrillers. Sometimes, though, it just seems to me that who cares? You know, the cop is chasing the serial killer and there will be a shootout at the end and the good guy will win. Um, and sometimes that just seems irrelevant to me. And um, I felt the need a few years ago to write something that's a little more relevant and a little more important and a little more tied to the issues that we're really facing in this world, which are not ever serial killers. I mean, the, the number of thrillers and mysteries that are set around serial killers is unbelievable considering how every day we confront hundreds of more serious issues to our safety than that. And we ignore most of those. And I wanted to stop ignoring real issues. And, and I, we sensed that in this book, and that's why we loved it so much. It's a great thriller, but it's not just that. It's something important. Life issues, it was, uh, it's a must read for all of our listeners. Uh, you're going to love it. And before we close, I want to say you're also going to want to connect with Chris Pavoni. You can find him on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and you can find him on his website. Oh, no Twitter. Not you can find me on Twitter. I will tell you one Twitter I found thing. You on, I thought I found you on Twitter. That was Did you? Are there any tweets? Uh, there, uh oh. That Is was it fake an imposter? News. Okay, uh oh. <laughs> Don't look for him on Twitter, and I'm getting off as now. As far as I know, <laughs> I, I was uh, doing book promotion in 2014. I was in a, a hotel in Dublin, and somebody told me that Stephen King had just tweeted out something nice about one of my books. So I went onto my computer and what I thought I was doing was sending an email to Stephen King saying thanks. And what in fact I was doing was sending a tweet. And I was so horrified that I <laughs> logged off and I never ever opened Twitter again. Twitter is not something I want to participate in. I don't want to spend my days yelling at strangers about issues. Um, and Stephen King just tweeted again a couple of weeks ago about this new book that he liked it very much. And this time I stayed clear of it and made sure that we're not in fact taking the tweeting thing for a second time. All right, good for you. Sorry. I don't blame you. But let me also say, and I know this is true, you have an excellent website and you can all the listeners can sign up for your newsletter hear what's going on. So uh, we just thank you so much for joining us here today on Bookstorm. And it was a pleasure. And we can't wait to see what you've got coming next year or the year after. We're going to be waiting for that. We're hoping to see one of the, this in a film. That's my next hope. Me too. Thank you, Chris. Thanks. Thank you, thank Chris. You. You can thank log you so on. much for having me. So great talking to Chris Pavoni. And I'm telling you, Kristen, so many issues inside this book. And I guess I think he really nailed it at the end there when he said, 
he wanted to write a fiction story that had a little bit more importance. And we both caught that in this book. We had about 10 questions that we had to carve down just to talk about. And this idea of narcissism that you brought up, I read something the other day that said 1% of people walking around in this world are psychopaths and, and narcissists, I mean, full-blown psychopaths. I'm going to go so far as to say I think it's even higher than that from just the narcissist perspective. And um, what was your take on that? You felt that too? Oh, yes. I mean, when you start looking at what a narcissist displays in terms of characteristics, I, I think you will start to see a lot of aspects of people around you and your family and your friends, people you've dated. And of course, not everybody is a full-blown narcissist. And of course, there's maybe not a diagnosis. But you see those tendencies where they are the center of the story of their life and everybody plays a role in their life. And when people step out of that role, they don't like that. And it causes a cognitive dissonance that then they react to. And that's some scary stuff, mm -hmm. you know, when you encounter that. It is that. some scary stuff. And um, I really feel like uh, we all are a little bit narcissistic at some time in our lives. I think the difference is, and this goes back to some characters in Chris's book, the difference is the ability for a human being to have empathy towards another human being. Mm -hmm. And I think the full-blown narcissist simply inside their very DNA structure or their psyche from some hurt in childhood has a total inability for empathy. And I've often read that they will behave with empathy and they may say the right things because they have watched what other people say and do and they say in their mind, this is clicking right now, I need to say this, although they have an inability to feel it. Yeah. A little bit of that makes me feel sorry for them in a way because uh, sorrow and um, empathy and longing and these kinds of things that the normal human being feels as much as sometimes they're difficult that's who makes us. That's what makes us what we are, people who are, have the ability to care for each other. But I saw that, and then he also brought up this idea of gaslighting. Do you want to? Do you have any? Do you know anything about that, or you want to say anything about that at all? Yeah, I think that's something that you know. Now we have a term for what people have been doing for eons, and this is stuff that, to me, it starts in your teen years. You start manipulating people. You start saying that's not what you saw or heard. You know, and believe me, I'm. I'm raising multiple kids. I know exactly what some of these behaviors look like. I even engage in them, I am sure. But I think the point is to have growth, to recognize those things in yourself and to address them. And I like how you brought that up today a few times with Chris, where we talk about being introspective, checking your behaviors against the damage in relationships. You know, are you the common denominator? Are you looking at yourself as objectively as you can? Is this appropriate? empathetic and respectful behavior. I think we all have to keep doing that mm -hmm. and checking ourselves. Yeah, and it's the hardest thing to do. You know, if you're in an argument or something, it's the hardest thing to do to look at your own self and say, did I play a part? But yeah. when you do that, you're only going to help your own self. And what I try to do, listen, I'm far from perfect, believe me, but a lot of times I try to put myself in someone else's shoes just for a little bit and look at the world from what their perspective what they see. And then sometimes I understand better people's actions or behavior or whatever they're going through. I understand better. Helps me to be able to react in a different way or uh, maybe just to understand in a different way, tolerate in a different way, those kinds oh, of things. I, I'll tell you something. I taught undergrads for a time and I had given them an assignment to look at both sides of a very controversial issue. And there was a segment of the class that was unable to articulate the concerns of the other side and you know they didn't understand the assignment it's one of those situations but they could not understand the assignment they could not put themselves in the shoes of a version they did not believe in and let me tell you even my explaining to them this is what you you know failed to do didn't even register it, it was just incredible to me that I think is part of what Chris is also addressing and that is we are in a time in society right now where things are very polarized, but many people have lost that ability to step back and objectively evaluate facts that we should be able to agree upon. If it's a fact, we should have some agreement on it. We no longer are doing that. 
you know, if it doesn't fit with the narrative, if it's coming from a person that we want to discredit, it's no longer a fact that is accepted. That's a dangerous place to be. It is dangerous, and I think I I think it's more with the youth of today than, and I, I hope I don't agree. So, but I feel <laughs> social media is adding to that. Yes, because it's teaching these yes. kids. It's me more about me and a little bit about me, and they're having a more inability to realize that they're not the center of their own universe and let me look at someone else's perspective. But that is key in everything in life. It in is every relationship in every career, in every uh, friendship, marriage, anything, you have to be able to put your own self aside now and then temporarily and put someone else's life over yours temporarily. I uh, think at some point. But I think it's adults also. And you know, I can barely go on Facebook anymore because of the disgusting things that I see people posting about the people they're disgusted with. You know, there's this broad brush, all, blanks are this, all Republicans are this, all liberals are this. We can't do that. We have to step back and start evaluating people, first of all, for who they are, look at their actions, instead of reacting to a label. And it is sickening to me. You know, as Chris has pointed out, it has accelerated in the past decade or so. You and I talk about this all the time, where this world is very upside down. And I think a large part of it is coming from these disagreements over things that should be factual and aren't mm -hmm. and are being misconstrued yeah. and portrayed in uh, morphed unrealistic ways and called fact and yeah. Chris nailed it too with that yeah. very much so yes uh, readers this is just a fantastic book as you can see from our discussion uh, we couldn't talk about the plot very much but I have to tell you it had me on the edge of my seat the entire time. I could not put this book down. It is a thriller, and there's a mystery in it, and it's a whole lot of fun in addition to mm -hmm. a very important book. So uh, let me just say thank you for joining us today. Uh, I don't know if you know the latest, but we're very proud to report that Bookstore and Podcast is now being listened to in 23 countries, 233 cities, almost 50 states, including Hawaii. Given a little shout out to our incredibly talented sound engineer and producer, the Mr. Mark Carey. Mark, just step in and say hi, because we owe you a lot here. Hello, hope you guys enjoyed the show today, and uh, we will see you next week. I don't know where we'd be without this guy. It wouldn't be anywhere good. We're gonna leave you with a few storm predictions to pique your interest, because our summer lineup is amazing. We have Ellen Marie Wiseman and her book, The Lost Girls of Willowbrook. We have Dolan Perkins Valdez, Take My Hand. We have Greer Hendricks and Sarah Pekinen, The Golden Couple. We have Emily Henry and Book Lovers and Karen Slaughter with Girl Forgotten. And listeners, one of the best ways to brave the storm is to dive down deep into life-changing fiction. Thank you.